Hello and welcome everybody. Here in Broadgate Clinic in Horsworth, I'm going to talk to Simon Smith, who's a chiropractor, and we're going to talk about how to take care of your back, some myths about disc injuries, myths about ageing and the spine. We're going to dive into different kinds of exercise, focusing on people who are over 50, and a whole load more tips and tricks to help keep you happy and healthy. So Simon, over well, to you. Well, um, I've been a chiropractor for nearly, well, 25 years this summer. Uh, so. Chiropractic is an art, of, uh, a medical uh, art form whereby basically you're using manipulation principally to uh, influence the nervous system. So you're manipulating the spine, the joints of the extremities to improve the function of the nervous system. And the basic premise of chiropractic is that your body has an innate ability to heal. It kind of has this inbuilt programming to get you better. And it's this dis-ease, this interference in the nervous system, the communication pathways that stop that happening. So what we're doing is removing the interference, helping speed that process up, and then just get things working better by specific manipulation. Okay, so you spoke about manipulation, because lots of people associate chiropractic with all the clicking. Could you explain um, in layman's terms what's happening and why it's perfectly safe and such sure. like? Yeah. Well, for a start, the safety aspect of it is we have four years of rigorous training and it's a full length medical course in many respects. Uh, and we spend four years learning how to manipulate before we're actually allowed to do it. So you're building up the sensitivity for a start. So this is not just anybody coming along and grabbing hold of somebody's neck and twisting it, uh, as you might imagine, whilst on holiday in Turkey or something. So what you're learning to do is a very, very fast, very, very short distance thrust. So my th when I'm manipulating a neck, for example, the thrusts are about two to three millimeters, it's, but it's very, very quick. So you learn this control of being able to move very, very quickly for a very, very small distance. Uh, and that's where chiropractic is unique because we um, are very specific. You know, only the bone that we want to move moves. Uh, all the others are isolated so they can't and it moves in the direction that we want to. Uh, so it's very much a, a specific high velocity but low amplitude thrust. Okay, so do all chiropractors do um, adjustments or is it something that... They do, there are offshoot off yeah. branches of chiropractic. So for example, McTimony chiropractic tends to be a lot gentler, uh, uses different types of force, um, but typically all chiropractors are trained to use a baseline level of manipulation and then there are separate uh, strands of chiropractic, separate sort of methods of treating depending on what you believe to be going on that you can choose. So some use le fewer manipulations, some use more uh, release, active release type of things uh, where you are releasing muscles for example, but ultimately it does come down to influencing the nervous system, so it's how you do that. Uh, for example, if you're treating babies, I, I treat a lot of babies, now obviously you don't grab a baby's neck and twist it. So you have little tools that can provide tiny, tiny little forces that are, that are appropriate for babies and under very controlled circumstances, but it's still a, if we want to use the word manipulation, to the nervous system, it's not a crack to the neck, if that makes sense. Yes, yeah, definitely. So that leads me on to my next question. Do chiropractors train in other disciplines once you've qualified? Like we know that lawyers and everything and doctors have to always go on CPD courses. Yes. Yeah, the C we have uh, minimum requirements for, for CPD. You, you know, there are, you're doing at least 30 hours of courses as a minimum during the course of a year uh, to maintain your certification, your, your license to practice, if that makes sense. Um, but you're allowed that the free reign to sort of develop your own practice within that framework. So for me, I have an interest in paediatrics. Sports and rehabilitation is a big factor to me as well. So I tend to do a lot of that because I work a lot with athletes. So oh, that's I, brilliant. I, I, keep yeah. up, I keep up to skip date with the latest developments in that. Okay, so that leads me on to something else. Because first of all, we're going to talk about uh, workouts for people over 50 not just simple things like swimming and walking, but also you touched on rehab. What happens if a very frail or elderly person comes in? Well, the, the lovely thing is that when I talk to my colleagues is that I tend to treat my old people like I treat my athletes. And I, oh, think, right. that's, I think that surprises people. Um, but ultimately, they are a human being with exactly the same joints. Those joints just happen to be older. So the, the movement is valid for what the joint, the person, the, the area needs 
you just adapt it to the level of ability of that person. So you start off gently, you scale it down, uh, you break the movements down, uh, you work on components. So for me, rehabilitation is quite a, a science. It's not just, oh, go and lie on the floor and, and stretch your back out for a minute or two. There are phases. You know, I typically take my patients through four or five phases, uh, and in those phases are several to a dozen different methods of getting them better. So it's, I always sort of say, I, I will get people as, as far along as they really desire to go because I have, you know, I've, I've seen people get to a very high level if they want to, or if you just want to be able to walk the dog at a weekend, that's fine too. Okay, so what would you say are the top five reasons people come to see you? Uh, well, because people find out about us when they need us, usually it's people come with back pain, neck pain, shoulder pain, usually some injury. It's nice when they come in with some of the other things. For example, this week I had a, uh, a young, uh, uh, a teenage girl brought in by her father because she has uh, upper respiratory problems. I have another patient who has stomach acid problems and so because you're manipulating the nervous system you find that these things change because you're changing how the body regulates itself but mostly it's musculoskeletal stuff and then the, the, the art is then finding what caused that. You know, fixing the problem is easy to do but you have to help the person find the cause and eradicate that otherwise they'll just be back again. So that's the fascinating aspect, that's the interesting bit. And obviously people come to you when they need something, can people just come for an MOT or something like that? I'd recommend it. it it's this, we have this uh, faulty assumption in England that once you're fixed, you're fixed, that nothing bad can happen until you feel pain and then all of a sudden something started. Uh, we kind of take it for granted as a, as, a, as a given that our teeth decay if we don't do something about it. Um, but we just have this assumption that our bodies will be fine and that we don't need to exercise, we don't need to eat healthily, and they'll be fine. And then one day they miraculously break down. And it's not helped by a lot of times people suddenly get aches and pains in their knees. They go to the GP and the GP says, well, it's arthritis, what can you do? Um, but it, the, everything starts somewhere and it, can, and it can be reversed. You know, you can stop this. I mean, uh, so it's about maintaining it. You know, you fix something and you get it checked up. You know, every chiropractor gets a maintenance visit regularly and most people should. Well, everybody should really. You go and get your teeth done. Why shouldn't you get your back done? Yeah. Another question that people always ask me is what's the difference between a chiropractor and an osteopath? Uh. A lot of it comes back down to the historical origins of it, uh, and it's in it, there's an interesting backstory which we're probably a bit too long to go into now, but effectively the, the two uh, men who invented each style did it very close together in America uh, in uh, the same year effectively, so these guys knew each other. So I think it was more a question of them the, having a differing of philosophies, so chiropractic is as I described about very short, quick, tiny adjustments. Uh, osteopathy, that's because the founder of chiropractic thought that the bones moved out of place and pressed on nerves and that caused mm -hmm. the dysfunction. The founder of osteopathy thought that bones moved out of place and caused a blockage of the flow of blood and lymph fluid which then built up a pressure which then pressed on the nerves and created that. Um, as we now know, we weren't entirely right they weren't entirely right and neither of us was entirely wrong. So there is a bit of everything that goes on and so that's why osteo osteopathic techniques tend to be gentler by name and more sort of soft and pumping but less specific so they use the more of the whole body to, to move rather than the chiropractors go right we're going to move that on that. So in some respects if you've got someone that has a hypermobile joint so say for example you have a low back that's very very stiff and the joint above it starts to move too much to compensate mm. if you're doing longer lever techniques you're going to move the thing that's already moving you need to isolate that and that's where I think chiropractic has a slight edge on osteopathy that said, sometimes people are too tender to work on and osteopathy edges in in that. So really, it's horses for courses, but both, yeah. it, at least somebody's doing something good to you. And that's so I was going to say, it's, would you say it's like apples and pears rather than bananas and coconuts? Exactly, yeah. yeah. Okay. That's the thing. It's very much that uh, they get people better uh, and it's very much personal preferences to which. Okay. So back to the osteopaths and the chiropractors, how are they regulated in, say, the UK? Well, there is the General Osteopathic Council and the General Chiropractic Council, so every chiropractor has to be a member of that uh, to get sort of a, a regulation to be able to practice legally under the name of a chiropractor. 
Um, so that's one way that you can be certain that the person that you're seeing is, is, a, is a valid character, as it were. There, there are you know, sort of exceptions to that, but that's generally the, the rule. Yeah. That leads on to my next question. What would you, when somebody's choosing a chiropractor, what kind of things should they look out for? The wonder of chiropractic is you're am it's amazing what things can improve. Like, as I mentioned, this uh, person who's getting stomach acid problems and by manipulating the spine, the, the sort of visceral nerves are calming that down. And so you see truly amazing things happen when you're treating people. And so you, I, I'd say you want somebody who is passionate, basically, uh, who believes that the spine, the, the, the nerves, when left to their own devices, when the, the interference is removed, can heal the body. It's that idea that, you know, the, the founder of chiropractic um, had an expression that says, you know, what makes the body heals the body, that this, this innate sense of healing and you're removing the interference. When you just reduce it down to the level of pain, you're really shortchanging the person. If you basically see somebody go, right, you have a sprain of your neck, click, there you go, you're all better, then you're missing out the opportunity of saying, well, here's how you maintain your lifestyle the other aspects of balance, visual acuity. You know, I had a patient who got off the bed after I'd treated her and all of a sudden she went, oh great, I can focus on the floor again. My eyes work better because she just instantly notices that when she's leading into an adjustment, everything becomes more laboured and then as soon as she gets uh, the, the neck adjusted, the upper back adjusted, her eyesight clears up. Now, the optic nerves are in the skull. We're not manipulating the nerves of the eyes when you're doing the neck because they're too high up in the brain. But because of all the other interferences and balance, etc., you do get the differences. So there are some truly amazing things that happen if you let the body heal. Isn't there a famous story about a chiropractor that did an adjustment and somebody's hearing came back? Well, that was the originator. That's yes. how chiropractic yeah. is meant to have started. How true in hindsight it is, but you do see some pretty amazing things. But yeah, the founder of chiropractor was, uh, he, he was already a bone setter in, in the classical sense. You know, he used to travel around the Midwest of America uh, setting bones. And so he had these theories and he was working in his office in Davenport in Iowa. And the janitor, uh, a guy called Harvey Lillard, uh, was cleaning up. He was deaf. His ne he was holding his neck at an angle. So he put him on the table and clicked his neck and his hearing came back. I have to sort of say, he's Harvey Lillard is probably the bravest patient of all time, having been the very first person to put his trust in that man. Must have been amazing, but his hearing came back, uh, and that's the that's the story as as it as told. Uh, so, and then again from there onwards, it's it's done amazing things. So I can see you really care about your patients a lot. So I'm not trying to put you out of business, but what can people do to limit? how long they spend in your office, I mean, what could people do at home? Oh, you're not doing, you're not limiting me at all, because that's the fundamental crux of what I do, what I practice. You know, every time I get a new patient in, I basically sort of say, my job is to do half the work. You know, I have to do, the, I, part of my job, you know, or so rather, half of my job is to fix the person, the other half of my job is to teach the person how to look after them themselves. So for me, the rehabilitation process is 50% of what I do. Yeah. It's teaching the person how to, you know, well, I, I break it up, into, I'll go through it now, I break it up into four aspects. There's flexibility and mobility. So flexibility is how far can you stretch something. Mobility is how far will it move once it's loose. So that's the difference between sort of say pushing your head around and looking over your shoulder. So you work on those two components. Then you're having stability and strength so people say, well, you know, can I go back to the gym and strengthen up? Well, that's the last component, really, that should be done. You know, the stabilization, working, and I, I describe that as stabilizing, is getting those muscles that you don't think about working properly, your postural muscles, your pelvic floor muscles, mm -hmm. your, your muscles that control movement and like stability. Like housekeeping muscles. Yeah, housekeeping muscles. Yeah. And, and strengthening is finally those muscles that you can control, your biceps, your quads your glutes, those things which you should have control over. So those should be the last thing in the chain because every movement has a sequence. There should be a, a one, two, three. But if your body has, is weak in the number one muscle and you basically go to number, jump straight to number two or straight to number three, then there'll be an, an asymmetry, there'll be an inadequacy and that will then create a problem. The classic chiropractic analogy is your car and its tires. And if the tracking goes out on the tires, you don't notice anything on mile one, but by the time you've done 10,000 miles, your tires will be worn out on one side versus the other. Okay. 
and that's exactly what happens with the body that you have a slight asymmetry a slight weakness you know i test people's muscles all the time and people would say they're absolutely fine and you hold the leg up you push it down and they can't hold it up against gravity they would never have said they could you know that it stops them going to the gym and going on the treadmill but it's obviously not working and my job is to find those and then give them the right exercises to do at their end so that I can do my thing at this end. And that's kind of the interesting stuff. So we're going to have loads of car analogies because they're basically not firing on all cylinders. All cylinders yeah, and then yeah. we've talked about having MOTs, but also sometimes when people come to you, it's like um, the car breaks down, you run out of oil and you put oil in the car when it's broken down and it's too late. So it's yeah. back to, you can prevent like a, 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 a biological breakdown by yeah. first of all coming to see you for an MOT and asking for your advice on, well, how can I keep myself healthy? And say if an injury happens, that would be a different uh, sort of situation. Very, very much so. Um, the, the saddest thing I have to say, you know, I say, you know, one of the saddest phrases that I say is, I, you know, when I see people on the street in their 60s, 70s, and they're bent over, and I just kind of almost under my breath go, oh, I wish I'd got you 20 years ago. Yeah. If only I'd seen you 20 years ago, I could have stopped that happening. And that's, that's my passion, yeah. effectively, is preventing that and and also my frustration when people don't get the message that they their spines do need work you know yes it's a lifestyle choice and some people choose to look after their cars and some people don't but ultimately you only get one spine you can change your car if, if it runs out of oil and the engine blows up you can buy another car yeah. you can't get another spine and and we have a uh, we put a, a meme up on our Broadgate Facebook page recently and saying you know do I need a chiropractor question answer do you have a spine well then yes because every spine needs care because that's your nervous system it's the thing that keeps you alive you know I, I sort of joke you know if we cut off your head your body won't keep working if those nerves aren't going to your heart it won't beat you know if the nerves don't go to your lungs you won't breathe you know um, you're pretty much without a nervous system you're dead in the water oh yeah definitely it's like the gaffer it's the big boss of yeah. the whole body it's the overall controller basically so there are there are two elements yes you fix the problems that they come in for and you try to educate them that there are things you can do and that is well basically the the the, the ones are eat well move well and sleep well uh, so those are the big you know the three so i don't just talk about their spine things is i talk about an exercise i talk about nutrition i talk about um psychological things such as sleep stress uh, you know, relationships, all of this kind of stuff about making sure that the all the toxic stress is in your life because mental stress will change how your hormones work, which will change how your body works, which will then lead to a breakdown somewhere along the way. And there are some very complicated, but complex pathways in the brain which link your stress, your, your the way your body perceives, you know, emotional stress as a physical stress and you get the response, you know, you get changes in your fight and flight Oh, absolutely, because it ramps up the sympathetic nervous yeah. system and it so, makes people more sensitive to pain. Exactly, and, and so therefore, you stress and tension. You get muscle patterns, don't yeah. you, in a very stressed person. Yeah, yeah, this is the thing, you know, and even when you're then going into the complexity of epigenetics and, you know, stressed mothers breed stressed oh, babies. Yes, yes. You know, that's the thing, you know. It's Something about the sins of our forefathers last four generations yeah. that um, if your parents lived really well, you can piggyback off some of their epigenetics and yeah. partly that explains why some people sort of you'd think they're abusing their bodies and nothing ever happens, but you don't know anything about their, their parents or their grandparents. Well, yeah. And it goes the other way, that if you look, don't look after yourself and then have children, you're predisposing them to... Well, you're basically transferring all your bad habits on them when they don't even have a choice. Yeah. We've covered lots of different aspects and also um, that chiropractic is suitable for very small babies, ill people, athletes, older people, even, would you say, even very elderly people in their 80s up to their 90s? I've got a patient who's 92 and she comes in every two months for a, for a quick uh, care treatment and she kind of walks down and she walks back and we keep her nice and tall and straight and everything's working. You know, age is no barrier. Yeah. That reminds me of something. So you can perfectly happily treat people with Parkinson's. Um, yes. I suppose dementia's different because they'd come with, with somebody else and it's, yeah. it's more of a a brain-based thing uh, and then things like MS and the other groups of neurological conditions so again you can help people who think oh I can't be helped and you have can. ALS and stuff. I've got a couple of I've got a couple of Parkinson's patients and yeah. a couple of MS patients and they respond very well to a certain style of chiropractic what we were talking earlier about different offshoot branches yeah. and, and, and types of chiropractic 
one of the things I practice, which is advanced biostructural correction, and that uses some stretches to the meningeal ligaments uh, in the spine, and that takes tension away from the, from the brain stem, and they seem to think that a component in Parkinson's is caused by this adverse traction and tension on the spine. So they respond, they're steadier, their balance is better, they're steadier on their feet, they feel the floor better, and it makes a big difference. Because I suppose in part it's the Parkinson's posture as well that they're pulling. Because yep. that's that technique you were really excited about, isn't it? The one where you, is it like a giant nerve floss where yeah, you're, you're moving, flossing the spinal cord? And you're freeing it all of these tiny micro adhesions that build up with these so called benign aches and pains that you get. You know, people sort of, people come to me and go, oh, well, I, you know, I get aches and pains, but I'm gardening. It's like, well, no, you're not meant to get aches and pains. Yeah. It's not normal to be in pain. Any pain is abnormal, but yeah. we, we're almost. Uh, cultivated by the adverts of for neurofen and, and, and things that it's okay to get pain because it's you've done a good job oh, it's, just old age. it's just old age and things like this I get people coming in all the time sort of say you know in fact my classic case was I had a lady coming in with arth an arthritic right knee and she said well it's okay because it's arthritis and my GP you know, I, I had it x-rayed by my GP and he sort of said it's arthritis it's because of my age and I said well how old's your other knee then because that's the same age yeah, and I haven't got any arthritis yeah. it's nothing to do with age yeah. you, know, you know if you look after it I mean as I say I've got a 92 year old and she kind of you know walks up and around horse with and cookridge all the time no problems at all yet I've got some 30 and 40 year olds that couldn't get up that hill without getting out of breath so now talking about the patient say if someone's never been to a chiropractor before uh, what what happens? Um, well, the first thing we do is we take a detailed medical history. So we have a very detailed questionnaire. You know, it takes about fifteen minutes to fill this mm -hmm. in because we are primary contact diagnosticians. Mm -hmm. we, you know, people come to us, and they might have anything wrong with them. This is part of the, the beauty of chiropractic is that the education. You know, we we have years of of medical training. You know, in general diagnosis. You know, pathology, physiology, uh, all of these aspects, radiology, and so. Uh, we're, we're trained to ask the right questions, to pick up things that the person might not know they need to tell us. You know, you might be speaking to somebody with back pain and it turns out that that's actually due to cancer, they just don't know about it. Okay. So you have to be prepared for the worst and trained for the worst, or people with chest pain and it's a heart problem. So you have to have those parallel trainings. So when they come in, we take a detailed medical history and that briefly outlines the problem, their past medical history, any other attendant medical things, we have a sort of checkbox tick list of things that might be associated with the nervous system. So we find out about, you know, sort of, for example, respiratory problems, asthma, eczema, uh, you know, menstrual issues, yeah. all of this kind of stuff. And then we take them in uh, once they've had time to fill that in and we sit and ask them what's going on. So we'll sort of start and get them just to talk. Ask them how it starts, what makes it worse, what makes it better. Just get them to talk in their own words, and then we put the pieces together. We ask it stuff that might have happened in the past, how often it's happening, um, does anything else happen that's unusual. So you really probe around and you get a feel for what's going on, and you then you know ask the relevant questions that we need in terms of you know how many times has it happened, does it travel anywhere in the body elsewhere that it does it? Do you get anything that's worsening, anything that worries the person? So once you've got a detailed medical history, then we get them changed into a, a gown for the females. Guys generally just take the top halves off. And we then do a detailed postural screen. So we basically just stand them up and see how stable they are. We'll see, you know, do they totter forwards? Do they slump? Are they round-shouldered? Uh, do they st stand twisted but their body, you know, do they stand up but their bodies are twisted to one side or leaning over onto one leg? You know, people come in with a low back pain and they've got... They, you know, they happen to have knee arthritis, but you realise, well, the whole reason they've got knee arthritis is because they're standing more on one leg than another. Their weight distribution is wrong. Then you start to move them around, get them to bend, twist, you know, see how their body moves, see where it hurts, see where it doesn't, see what they're capable of. And then you lay them on the bench and you start to do your, you know, passive examinations. You, when their body's relaxed and not moving, then you're feeling for fixations, muscle spasm, but also stuff like changes in skin colour, skin temperature, um, what's the muscle spasm like feel underneath the skin? Are they twisted? You know, when they are stood up, are they twisted in the same way as they are when they're laying down? Or does the body change shape as soon as you relax the muscles? Uh, does the tension travel? You know, so they might have low back pain and then when you're laying down, you see that actually the, the tension travels up through to the opposite shoulder, for example, or that they might have a hip pain, but they're holding the neck awkwardly. 
and then you run through the orthopedic test. So again, you're finding out mechanically what's going on in the joints, but then you're also doing a complex set of orthopedic tests. So you're, you're testing for ligament sprains, arthritis, disc injuries, all, all the serious things, as well as neuro then we do a neurological check. So you're checking for upper motor neural lesions. You know, you, you sometimes get people in with serious uh, neurological conditions. You know, I diagnosed a case of multiple sclerosis before mm. she'd been to anybody else, and I wasn't happy about it. So there was something wrong about the neurological screen, so I had to send her out, and that's when she got a definitive diagnosis. So you can sometimes pick up things that can make a big difference to people uh, when you find it early. Yeah, because also um, you yourself have experienced back pain, so it's not like you don't understand the people coming in. That is Because I think um, discs are really common. I've seen a lot of people go, oh no, you mustn't go and see anybody who's got a disc. You must wait for an MRI, you mustn't move, and don't go and see anybody, mm -hmm. don't let anybody touch you. And having experienced a disc injury yourself, what would you say about that? You know, this whole thing of, oh, don't go and see until you've had an MRI. Well, we've only had MRIs for the last 10 to 15 years. What were people doing before we had this late... It's almost a lazy technology. It's beautiful and concise and you see beautiful pictures, but it's, it's, people have given up diagnosing now. I was trained in the days before MRI and my orthopedic tests were, had to be specific enough to actually figure out the shape of that disc bulge, where it was, how big it was, what direction it was going in. All of these tests are possible because that's what we had to do before yeah. you couldn't just operate on someone to find it. You had to have these tests before the MRI, but now people just go, oh, well, we'll just send you off for a scan. It's fine. Um, so they can be very misleading yeah. because I've seen some crazy backs, as in images, and the person still runs marathons, and yet we encounter yeah. people all the time that are in absolute agony and there's not a sausage on the, yeah. on the, on the X-ray or the MRI. When MRIs were being tested mm -hmm. prior to being rolled out, they were using members of the public and 40% of asymptomatic people, you know, 40% of the public who said they'd never had any back pain had bulging discs. They just didn't know about it. You know, loads of people have bulging discs. It just doesn't cause pain. The disc is not the problem. It is what happens around that area and the irritation to the nerves. I mean, you talked about myself. I have, you know, I've got a couple of disc injuries uh, that I've had over the years. I have treatment. And nothing stops me doing things now. And in fact, that's what my rehab basically is saying, you know, to patients. I use myself as an example. I say, you know, you're lucky. Your chiropractor has a bad back. So I know for a start, when you're in agony, I know what that feels like, yeah. which basically makes me work fast. Uh, you know, I don't mess around. I, I try and get the person out of pain as, as quickly as possible because I've been there. And I know what a couple of days of pain feels like, never mind six months of pain. Uh, and you know, not being able to get out of bed in the morning and not being able to go into bed at night because it hurts too much and sleeping on the floor in the lounge, you know, I've done that. Um, so there is that aspect, but also I've rehabilitated my back and you know, I, I do crazy things now. Um, yeah, that, that's yeah. great because that's going to lead, lead us into the Navy SEALs challenge, but also I think just to finish off with the pain that, that the, your body is very good at developing habits and um, practice makes permanent. So if you just leave yourself in pain, it's like the opposite of drug addiction, isn't it? That the more pain you're in, the more um, your pain receptors uh, get more sensitive, so you feel more pain, as in it's like the opposite with some drug problems. The more drug you put in, the more you desensitize the body. So for all these people who are in agony, it's much better to get and go and see somebody rather than sitting around for months waiting for an MRI. Would you say that being like that for... Very much so, yeah. And also, could you then label yourself as, I have, I've got a bad back, I've got chronic pain, whereas it could be something that you could help with? Very much so. You do, you do see that a lot, that people will stay in pain because it's almost like they haven't been given permission yeah. uh, to get it sorted. It's almost like they're saying, well, I'm, I'm, the doctor's put me for, for an MRI, so I have to wait for that. Well, why? When there are people that can help, I have, uh, you know, ultimate uh, uh, respect for, for doctors. Yeah. Um, and they are great at doing a lot of things. By the very nature, they're called general practitioners. They see an awful lot of stuff. I see backs. I look at backs all day, every day, and I'm good at it. I don't mean that in an egotist way, yeah. but that's all I do. If you ask me about bacterial infections, I because I wouldn't come to you if, if yeah. you didn't say things like exactly. that. Because I wouldn't trust you. <laughs> exactly. All I do yeah. is see hundreds of backs every week, every month. And for everyone who's come in with a, with a new back, I've seen it before. After 25 years, you know, I have seen thousands and thousands of backs. I, you know, 
I know how to get them better. Well, we all do here. We all do. I'm talking personally, but we all oh, yeah. you know, chiropractors yeah. yeah. specialise in this. I know, you know, as far as the Advertising Standards Authority, you know, say we're not allowed to use the word, we're not specialists in back. But I think if you do something to the exclusion of all else, you are a specialist in it. It's like the one thing, you know, that book, mm. it's all about it's if you focus thing. on one thing, yeah. you're going to get really good at that. Yeah. And yeah. also, isn't there that um, the 10 year rule or the yeah. 10,000 hours? 10,000 hours of things. And I think I've probably spent about 10,000 hours doing this. So, yes, you, you, we can safely say you're an expert. And, and there are things I can't get better, there always will be. And, you know, there are times when you're working on somebody and going, actually, this has gone to the point where I, it is beyond what I can do, we need to send you back. So quite often I will feed people back into the medical system because they do need an MRI, they do need a surgical consultation. Sometimes that will be sooner than others. You'll get people in and go, no, I, I, this is not, you need to go see someone straight away because this is not my, my remit. Um, I think you need to see a surgeon, let's send you straight back um, and things like that. But um, it is one of those things that, you know, we spend a lot of time looking at backs so you do get to know the uh, gamut and that's nice because you can say to somebody look I know you're in a lot of pain but I had someone in this like you know last week and they're better now so you'll be better and even there's that reassurance you know for us it's that hand on the shoulder and reassuring somebody saying yeah you will get better um, you just have to take the time and do the stuff you know and that's the whole point is I can get you better but you have to do your bit Yes. You won't get better if you don't do your bit. But it's also empowering the patient to, mm. um, to be responsible and not becoming dependent on you as well. Well, that's the big thing of why I do it. I, yeah. I, I think, you know, it's, A, it's, I think you owe the person the courtesy to say, look, you know, you have to be involved because it's your back. How, how dare I just act like I know everything and mm. do what I do and, you know, just, you know, don't ask questions, just do what I do. It's like, no, you're in on this deal. You know, here, look, let me tell you what I know about your back. This, so now you know as much as I do about what's going on inside of you and this is how you can look after it. Here's something else for how you can look after it. You know, and that talks of nutrition as well. How do, you, how do you nourish your body to repair itself you know, without going overboard or needing to go overboard? So if you're completely honest and upfront with your patients about what you can do, what you're doing, mm. how they can help you, it becomes like a team effort and you're not hiding anything or doing some special, I don't like saying what's it woo woo, but mm. it's all out in the open and it's a team effort. I find what I do really exciting so I like yeah. to talk about it. Yeah. I, I find it really cool because when I look at patients getting better, I know they're going to get better but when it happens it's amazing to look at. I, I look at bodies untwist within 15 minutes you know I'll see people's posture change they'll come in bent double and then I'll, I'll, I'll treat them and they'll be upright and I think you know I, I know I'm doing the adjustment but it's the body that's doing the change yeah. I'm just the I'm just the mediator of change I'm not some genius I'm not some godlike you know guru I'm just I, I'm pressing something in the right place but that body changes shape it's amazing to look at I don't understand why people aren't more amazed at what their bodies can do and how blasé they are about it you know I think that's the thing when you see people who are overweight it's a choice you know who don't exercise all of these choices that people make but they have this amazing piece of machinery I mean we could never build a body the complexity of yeah. what we are we could never build and people wreck that and that angers me sometimes yeah. but, but I think also never underestimate the body's um, capacity to heal oh honestly yes it's never too late they always sort of say it's you know you know it's never too late and, until it's too late but you know there is you can always do something and I know we're going to talk about being over 50 and things like yes. that later on and that's where it comes in you know uh, when we're sort of talking about saying yes you'd be amazed at what you can do so um, on to the I the um, the fitness now because mm. Some people, um, A, they think they're never going to get better, and other people get better but then won't do anything because they think they're going to do their back in again. So, as you said before, you had some disc injuries, but also do you want to, first of all, uh, explain a bit about the Navy SEALs training? Uh, no, it wasn't actually, it was a whole Navy SEAL, it was more than that, plus the training that you do now, because it is quite uh, intense. Mm -hmm. Well. A, a, a few years ago, two, two or three years ago now, I decided that I wanted to set myself a challenge and there was, I, I wanted to do something that was impossible. I wanted to, to achieve something that was almost impossible to, to do. And it's, you can go to, there is a, a way you can actually go to San Diego where the US Navy SEALs are based and do this intensive uh, weekend crucible event where you pretty much on the go from 
seven o'clock on the Friday morning through till mid-afternoon on Sunday and you're basically going non-stop. You don't sleep, you don't stop, you're moving pretty much the whole time. Uh, you spend sort of six and a half to seven hours in the ocean on the first night being battered by waves, shivering and then, you know, close to hypothermia until they get you out and run you along the beach uh, until the dawn comes and then you're off to the next thing and then climbing mountains in the desert. They take you back out into the desert in California and then you're carrying sandbags up and down mountains. You're moving constantly. Um, you're having to, you know, you have minimum fitness standards. You know, you have to be able to... Uh, do sort of like sort of 50 press ups without putting your knees down within two minutes and you have to do all of these sort of fitness tests you know there are certain benchmark standards and i always sort of joke it took me about you know two years to be fit enough to train solidly for a year to be able to get to it uh, and i was the oldest person fit in my class sort of doing it by about 18 years uh, so i was a lot older than anybody else so i was a mature athlete and i was 49 when i did it and um that attrition on the body is hard. You, you have to train differently as a 40 plus year old as you as a 20 plus year old. Um, so I did that and that was a challenge that, but it, it, it really, it was more than a physical challenge, it was a mental challenge because you, you wanted to quit all the time and you could quit at any time and you just didn't. And the, and the aspect was that you realise by the end of it that you can do anything. You know, since then I've done another Navy SEAL challenge where we uh, recreated, the, uh, for charity, we recreated the Normandy landings last June, on, on June the 6th, where we paddled uh, a boat ashore from like seven miles out at sea, in, you know, from pre-dawn in the fog, in the rain, to land on Omaha Beach. Uh, then we filled rucksacks with 45 pounds of sand and then we marched 25 miles to San Lo. And so we, we did that sort of endurance event there and you're sort of, you know, jogging along with 45 pounds of sand in your bag for, you know, let's say for seven odd hours or so. So you do these things because it, uh, and therefore you have to be able to train for that. I was just about to come on to that. So could you briefly go over what kind of training regime you had to do? I, I know you do CrossFit. I do CrossFit, yeah. uh, which is good and it's a balanced form of exercise. Yeah. And I, that might seem extreme to people, you know, watching this now thinking, well, I'm not going to do that. That sounds crazy. Yeah, but we'll come on to it, some things. Do, that people, we will do. Yeah. But effectively, I was training sort of five or six days a week doing different things where you are having to... And this does, this does come across the aspect of being fit, that you have... Um, different things such as tr training for work capacity, stamina, durability and strength. So there are different modalities that we should all train. So for example, if you just jog and that's your fitness, well that is getting you fit, but it's not balanced. Uh, and so there are the, uh, keeping it simple, if you imagine that you have to be strong, you know, to be able to carry a work, to carry out a workload, Work capacity is your body's ability to keep going, so in terms of uh, cardiovascular type yeah, of like fitness, as it were. Yeah. Um, but well, that comes more into the stamina aspect of it might be low key, but you're doing it for an awful long time. So you might be so one of the things, for example, is stretch carries that we were doing. You know, you'd have a person on a on a metal stretcher, yeah. and between the four of you and the fifth member on the on the stretcher, you are carrying these people for about a mile, and you're swapping over as you go, and it's sort of going as a team. You see, so there's there's stamina. Uh, and then there's durability, and that's the big key, because that's how can you look after your body to be able to survive these sorts of things. So that's such, such a things like as flexibility, yoga, um, core strength, Pilates, all of these aspects. So there are adjunctive types of things. So it's not all about running as fast as you can or lifting the heaviest weight you can. You, have, you break it down into different modalities. Because lots of people um, don't understand that um, if you're not flexible, you can never move your joint to the full range of motion. Exactly. You're never going to get your, your full body will, Yeah, Your body is basically a lazy creature that will adapt to the minimum stresses involved. Yeah. So if you never look over your shoulder, your body will go, well, why bother? But when I was training for these things, it, you know, it really broke down the possibilities. So now, the, the isn't, it's not can I do something, it's how am I going to do it. So I'm setting myself another challenge for this year where I'm going to try and run the Dales Way in 24 hours uh, and come back to the clinic. So I'm going to set it, I'm going to try and raise some money for servicemen's charities and I'm going to set off in Windermere and I'm going to try and get back to the clinic yeah, in, in or as close to 24 hours as I can. Um, oh great, because I'll, I'll make sure I'll share yeah. that just... Yeah, just because I yeah. want to see if I can. Which uh, charity are you doing it I'm going to use it for sort of veterans suicide and, and homelessness because I think that's a big issue and, okay. and, it, and it troubles me that there are so many people, you know, ex-servicemen and women, ex-servicemen and women, who are 
who are troubled with you know mental Ill, you know oh, mental well, illness PTSD, you know, PTSD very severe and, disability yeah, as and, well and this idea concept that you know yeah. you know with twenty two servicemen a day you know dying it's yeah. not a, it's not something that should happen and so because of having trained with uh, servicemen and been helped by them it's kind of my way of giving back a little bit I, I'm passionate about that uh, so I've got a few a few crazy things like that uh, and it's all basically because you just think well I'm capable of this. How do I inspire other people? Yeah, and that's why I say I do, I do this so that I can tell patients. Of course, you can run the London Marathon. You just have to get ready for it. Of course, you can do that. You just have to be able to do it. Let's um let's start with the guy. Say he's in his fifties and he's not fit and he's a little bit overweight. He had a bad back, similar to you. Uh, what and he wants to get fit. How? What would you suggest he he did? And and what would you also say he shouldn't do to start off with? Okay, so so effectively, you've, you've got a set of circumstances there. So you've got someone who's overweight. So they've got some only a little uh, bit, a little bit of weight. I don't want to say dad no, bod, no, but no. because that's not really overweight. Yeah. But, but he, they're probably he wants to keep on. He, he's got a bit older and he wants to regain his youth, but yeah. he doesn't. And he doesn't want to injure himself, and he still has to work, and he's got kids and stuff. Yeah. So you have to kind yeah. of take them through that sort of regime that I mentioned earlier, where you firstly have to get them moving so you train you you I have to do my bit that I'm fixing so I've obviously got to get rid of the fixations in the lumbar spine or uh, in that sort of area get the spine realigned with manipulation and whilst doing that you then start the person getting flexible getting them to move so that <clears throat> if you imagine that if they've got an area of tightness on one side or another and they start to say say for example playing squash so they decide to go back to playing squash but they're tight in the low back and they'll lean forward go for a deep court shot and because their body's never moved before they'll rip something because they're taking it beyond what it's used to so you increase you widen the body's parameters of movement in all the different ranges so you tackle those muscles the the short intrinsic muscles the longer tract muscles hamstrings glutes quads shoulder muscles be what it may and then so you get them moving better you then start to wake up the nervous system around those intrinsic muscles so that's core work um, movement pattern work as well so you can well, this like is all animal yeah. kingdom or sort of yeah animal flow type of yeah. stuff and and getting like for example the coordination of those one two three muscles that i mentioned earlier and at the same time you get them back to working out so you do get them at a low level now studies show that you should really only increase your work capacity in a fitness level by about 15 percent at any one time okay. you shouldn't say for example oh do a, like a bench press of 30 kilos and think oh that's great i'll do 60 kilos next because okay. you, it's you know going up by 100 percent and you'll you'll damage yourself but they found that a steady increment increase of 15 percent per session tends you know as maximum would and until you get to any stuck stuck points is safe enough so you that's why generally if you can and they have been exercising you keep them exercising you don't stop the person whilst you're treating them and this is the misconception people you know will quite often go to the gp and go oh well you need to stop exercising until you feel better because you're going right back down to zero so then you've got to go to 15 percent then 17 and a half percent and you're working up that sort of aspect so effectively if you're keeping them at 50 percent well you're already halfway there so you can move up at a quicker rate so you keep them doing what their body's used to because the muscle memory will help the recovery you know, there's no point you sort of saying, right, okay, I know you've never done yoga and you play squash, so don't do squash, do yoga, because their bodies won't be used to it. At least give them something that the body's familiar with and that they can then move on with and build up on all those modalities. But you cross train them. They need, you, your body weight alone won't do it sometimes. So you can, people don't like to go to the gym sometimes, but they perhaps should. So you work with, again, what the person wants. You know, again, there's no point in me saying do yoga if you absolutely hate yoga, because you just won't do it. Lots of people don't like the gym because they don't really know what to do. So would you say getting a good personal trainer or somebody to show you yeah. what to do or learn something like Olympic lifting because it's very, very technical and it teaches people yeah. so much alignment, which then they can, they've got drills and they can go off and do things on their own because people don't like the machines. And personally, I don't really rate the machines that much. I'm, what no. would you say? No. Would you say I, I, free weights? I would say f trying to use free weights, human anatomical movements as much as possible. When you're sitting at a um, at a machine, yeah. and yeah. they might just sort of say, "Well, the you know the shoulder press, it is actually you know the cam cam effect of, of this is is perfectly mim mimics what the shoulder does." Well, yes, it does. But you're sat down, so your back, if in nature, if you pick up a rock to lift it over your head to throw at a saber-toothed tiger, yeah. if we talk about what fi fitness is all about, staying alive ultimately, and you know, ten thousand years ago, that was, 
you know, finding food and killing something that might kill you. So effectively, fitness was basically how heavy a rock can I pick up to throw at that saber-toothed tiger? So it's no point sitting in a machine and doing this. If your back muscles aren't working, you need to have anatomical movements, which is where kettlebell classes, Pilates yeah. classes, all of this, where you're actually linking things through. You need to be stable whilst you move. So if you're not using your stability muscles um, because you're doing a, a leg extension machine and your quads are getting nice and big, well, that's not how life works. So you have to sort of balance that out a bit and, and move differently and move naturally. So you use those animal movements. But yes, you're right. Someone might not want to go to the gym. They might not want to go to where there's an Olympic lifting class, but there's lots of things you can do at home. What about swimming? So swimming and swimming's good. In terms of, um, just to jump um, back, we're still on this, a guy who had a bad back that's in his 50s, a little bit overweight. Would you, what would you I say? Swimming, I jogging or yeah. cycling? I would actually sort of say, I wouldn't sort of go back into swimming straight away. Okay. Simply because you need actually quite a bit of core integrity to be able okay. to kick with the legs. So, but it's, again, it's a lazy diagnosis. A lot of times people will come and go, well, I've been told I should go swimming. And I'll go, well, do you put your head underwater? Oh no, I hate getting my hair wet. Well, you're gonna have your back arched and that's gonna make your back worse. People don't ask, people don't investigate. People don't talk to the person and say, uh, how do you do that? They just go, I've heard swimming's good, go swimming. Well, it's not always good. What yeah. about um, rowing? Because that's another I one like people rowing. say, oh yeah. no, you mustn't row with a bad back. I've no. got a client who uh, won't row because somebody told her 10 years ago, in the gym, you mustn't row with a bad back. It, it's, it's rubbish. Yes, you have to train for it. And, and this is what I was about to sort of go on to say, is that you might not want to go to the gym and you might not want to do these things, but you do not know what you look like from the side when you're doing these exercises. You need someone to train your movement so that you know you're doing it foolproofly. I get someone to look at me when I'm training a new movement. I don't just figure it out myself. Um, and well, actually, sometimes I'll, I'll deconstruct it. And I'll, and, but the nice thing is that if you know you have good form, we all have mobile phones that have cameras. Video yeah. your technique, put it on a stand, what you know, or wedge it against a book, do the movement, see how you look, do you look like you meant to look or not? Because your body, if you do a, a movement f with a faulty pattern, all you're going to do is get better at doing it badly. That's you need to. Practice yeah. makes permanent. Practice make, yeah, practice makes permanent. Uh, and, um, and actually we used to have, you know, we, we, when we were at the chiropractic college and we were learning manipulation, you know, we used to say, oh, that practice makes perfect. No, perfect practice makes perfect. Yes. Practice doesn't make perfect. <laughs> perfect <laughs> practice makes perfect. Uh, and that was the thing. So you've got to do it right. So quite often I will, even now, you know, as I say, I, I deadlift, you know, 150 kilos. I can squat 100 kilos. You know, things that you should say, oh, should you be doing that with a disc? Yes, you should. But you should also do kettlebell stability. You should be doing walks. You should be doing durability exercises. Do you have to? No, of course you don't have to. You just do what you want to do at the level. You know, okay, I have, I set myself exceptional goals. But even the aspect, you know, I have ladies in, it's typically ladies. Um, I think I was going to ask again about, I suppose we've talked about a, a male who's hmm. um, kind of unfit. Would you say it's the same principle for a fit male in his 50s who had a back injury uh, and then it got better? What, what should he do? A fit male? Yes, he was fit. So yeah, it's, it's the same thing follows true, but you would break it back down. But you would, I would high, highly recommend so that you you work on the things that, ha you know, that yes, you might be going to the gym and lifting weights, but you must do your accessory movements. You know, if you're, if, if, say for example, you like to, you know, you go into the gym and one of the things you do is you work on like a back squat. Yeah. Well, you need to work on um, the flexibility of your hips, for example. So you must do the accessory movement. Are you waking up the glutes before you do it? Or are you just lifting, you know, and that's taking the strain. So. It's about understanding that there are accessory things to do as well. So when you've got someone who already has trained, you can then go up a little bit more and go, right, here's a mobility and flexibility routine you should be doing three times a week. Okay. Here's a recruitment exercise before you do. So you're activating muscles to get more. Here's some cross training things. So don't just squat, do some lunges, do some back squats, yeah, sorry, um, front squats, uh, things like that. So you then sort of ramp it up a little bit. Um, but what, what about I was talking, um, impact and jogging and jumping up and down on this? Impact's really good, especially in menopausal women. Oh yes. Yeah, really important. Don't you have to load yourself something like 
eight, uh, eight times your body weight to, to yeah. actually stimulate bone density and running in gym or gymnastics is the best one because of the, the landing and it's, yeah. it, it, but obviously very much it's so. dangerous. Skipping. Skipping, yeah. Skipping is very good. People go, oh, I've got bad knees. Well, you've probably got bad knees because you aren't flexible. Um, and that's another thing. Arthritic knees, well, that's because people don't stretch quads and hamstrings and get it all balanced. So you develop an imbalance. If you imagine you sit at a desk for 30 years like this with the knees bent, yeah. well, that's not how they're meant to be. This is a high pressure situation. So, you know, if you never take that knee past there, it'll never go up to the bum. And of course, you will wear your knees out. Also, the knees are really easy to get to because I like those things you hold, those rollers. Yeah, the foam roller thing. And, and you can do it on, there's no excuse, because you can mush it all out. You don't need to lie on the floor and roll around on a foam yeah. roller. You can sit even, at your desk. Even skipping, for example, yeah. it is about seven to eight times your body weight on impact. So you are increasing that calcific load. So for women who are, you know, po peri and postmenopausal, it, it, it takes decades off the, sp the age of the spine. Yeah. It really does. It, there's, and you asked about rowing. It, so yes, if you have a bad back and you get on a rowing machine and you don't do anything to check your technique, to get it looked at, and you just row and you're doing all kinds of bad movements, it is not good for you. If you get someone to go through a rowing technique, so you know that you're pulling with the legs, then there are, that you've got the back stable, that's good. Or are you doing some kettlebell swings to, to get the body moving in the right way? Are your, is your body stable? Then rowing is really good for you. Um, and I know because I hated rowing, yeah. but I'm actually quite good at it because I've got long legs. And so I didn't like rowing, but you know, it's a good exercise to do. So if I'm, a, if I'm advocating it, it must be good because I hated rowing at some point. Some point. And I suppose jogging is a similar to walking, is it, it, as in once you've been treated and you've ironed out little imbalances and everything's mm. moving better, all the joints are moving as a team, yeah. your posture's nice, you're not loading any joints excessively, and you're running and walking with good technique and yeah. proper footwear we won't go into shoes because we could be here for ages about footwear but would you say that's another thing that yeah. the running and rowing itself is not bad it's doing it badly yes. that's the problem uh, and again so you go going back to the flexibility aspect for one second yes flexibility will improve what's there but it can also pick out things that you didn't know so you might think oh my legs are fine um, I haven't got a problem with my knees You'll pull one heel, up, your left leg up to heel up to your bum and it goes all the way, but the right only goes halfway and you suddenly find that it's tight. Well, if you hadn't done that stretch, you wouldn't have noticed and then you would have run on this imbalance yeah. and created problems. So it's good to do these things as you're training because you can pick up stuff that you need to work on. Uh, you might notice that you land heavier on your right foot, your ankle feels a bit stiffer. Well, you work on it or your calf muscle always seems to ache on the right leg but never on there. That's an imbalance. So, so you tune into yourself as you're doing this, but actually training and exercising, you know, even at a low level, say for example, you walk for 10 seconds and you run for 20 seconds, and that's all you can do to start with. It's something, you're getting out of the house, you're doing something, you're getting fresh air, <laughs> you're getting sunlight on your body, you know, whatever you do, just go out and do it. But yeah, running, rowing, I've got a great a lot of time for actually. There's, and the studies are showing that there aren't any harmful effects on your knee cartilage. So anybody watching this who's been told by the GP that they shouldn't run because yeah. it'll wear your knees out, there is enough empirical evidence out there on longitudinal studies to show that running does not wear runners' knees out. Neither does squatting below 90 degrees. So that's another one for people who are doing any weight training. It is perfectly healthy to squat below 90 degrees. And in fact, doing so is healthier than the people who've said you should never squat below parallel. It, it, you know, my argument is if we're not meant to squat below parallel, why do our knees bend that far? Because our body doesn't waste anything. If you imagine our elbows aren't meant to go any further back than that, so they don't go any further back than that, but they are meant to come this way. So if that's the case, your body doesn't waste time doing something. If you didn't need to go below 90 degrees, it wouldn't let you. Therefore, it, it, we, our, our, our levers are designed to be able to cope with it. That's why we have kneecaps, so that you can go below parallel. So there's, no, there's a lot of evidence there to show it's absolutely fine. Movement, and this is it. The, of all the myriad complicated exercises I show people, the hardest thing to teach is how to squat, or how to, effectively how to sit on a chair. Because if you think a squat is effectively sitting on a chair, which people do hundreds of times a day, and they can't do it. They bend their ankles first. Yeah. They, they, the initial, again, I come back to that, there's a sequence of movement, a one, two, and three. And people, when they squat, do number three first. They bend their ankle. They think to squat that the ankle has to bend and they get 
they get jammed in when in fact actually it's the hip that needs to hinge first. So it should be hip, knee, then ankle, but it's basically ankle, knee, and then the hip's got nowhere to go. And so I have to spend ages teaching people how to sit properly and I have to get them to kneel against a chair so that they, they physically can't bend their ankles and stick their bum back as if they're shutting a drawer yes. or shutting a door because they can't do it. And they've done this for years, but you're thinking, how many times a day do you get up and down from a chair yet you can't do this simple exercise? And then, because what happens is people will go down and then they'll drop. They won't sit down properly. They won't squat properly. They'll drop. So yeah, it doesn't, it's, uh, it's amazing what you see people living their lives without doing it properly. Because yeah. I've got actually my own question about um, uh, sport or exercise and movement. What do you think about repetitive flexion and extension? So A, personally for me doing gymnastics and back flips and front flips, but people that play racket sports, because I know lots of my ladies like playing um, badminton and, and tennis. Is there any harm in continuously uh, flexing and extending the spine? Um, beyond a certain range, yes, yes there is. Um, what typically happens is where the fulcrum of rotation is. So if you imagine obviously you've got the rectus abdominis and the abdominal muscles at the front there, if they're weak and all of the flexion happens on the back part of the joints okay. rather than through the discs, then I would say that is because they're what they will tend to do instead of moving smoothly. If you, if you imagine you've got five lumbar vertebra all designed to do 20% of the movement. Okay. If four of those are stiff and the space between the L5 and the S1, the sacrum is, is the only thing that's moving, you're going to overflex it, and it's like when you take an old credit card and bend it in half, and you get the little white stress oh, that's line. A good analogy. That's what's going to happen effectively. So what you really need is smooth movement. So that's part of the stuff we train. You know, you would get someone to do a lunge. I mean, that's a good example. That, that talking back to the building it up, you start off with a simple lunge. So you get them to stretch their groin. Then you get them to lean the body into it a little bit more. Then you'd get them to maybe raise the rib cage up, and then go into the lunge. So you're then changing it you might get them to angle the body and stretch and rotate back or use a partner stretch. So there are scalable things. So we talked way, way back about old people versus young people. Same exercises, you basically take them to the limit of what they can do. I had someone, she was 65 in this morning. Again, she's got the same stretch as my 25 year old 15 minutes earlier. And she says, but you guide them through and you teach them how to do it and how it feels and you, you drill them through it, but effectively, you have to take them uh, to scale it up, and, and that's the thing. So if you're doing that hyperextension aspect, you need something to stop you going back, because that's where injuries, you know, people bend forward and they pull their back. Well, it's not because they've gone too far often, it's because they've gone too fast, and the mechanoreceptors in the spinal muscles that, you know, what your muscles do, they don't just tighten and control, they also let you out. So your spinal muscles, as you're bending forward, should be activated and let you go forward. But if that message, that corrupted impulse that we talked about, about the fixations in the spine and the message is not getting through, but what happens is you're going all the way forward and all of a sudden the mechanoreceptors fire off at full blast and it's like a lift that's going down and the emergency brake kicking in and it's suddenly jamming. And what happens is that lift cable snaps, or in this instance, it's the back muscles. And that's what's happening. So if you imagine you're doing that in a squash court and you're, you're brain is not getting the information fast enough. If you imagine that you're bending forward... So, so say when somebody's back does go, what actually happens? Well, a lot of times, effectively, if you imagine that... As, as, as there's something being pulled out of line, or has a muscle a been slightly things. overstretched and it's panicked and... You get a little bit of both. And you so get you spasm, do. or is, is a joint gone somewhere and the brain thinks, oh, I don't know, and this is in a different place, I don't know what to do now, let's just clamp down and lock down on the system. All three, effectively. Okay. Because what's happening is the accelerometers get happening in these muscles, and it's going too fast. It's pulling on the joint capsule, which is again sending messages back. Okay. And this can't talk fast enough because again, there's interference with the spinal cord and there's all this other stuff happening, all these other insults from further up, because again, it's not just here. The messages from here have to travel all the way up. So if you've got some interference up here as yeah. well, that's gonna cloud the issue. And so what happens is the body goes, oh my God, something bad's happening. Let's anchor down. Let's protect it by shutting down. So it jams and you're still going forward. If you imagine your upper body weighs six stone and it's still going forward and it has to stop. Well, that then pulls it, you see. Okay, so would you say um, when people like do their backs in, it, most of the, a lot of the time it's just that scenario and they haven't really broken anything or burst anything or slipped anything? More I don't often, often yeah, slipped yeah, yeah, more often than not. Yeah. Because, but this repetitive flexion and extension yeah. through, through a discal area 
will cause the disc to buckle. You know, it, it's a fibrous cartilage pad that isn't really meant to move an awful lot. It's kind of meant to flex a little bit, but if it's doing a lot of the extreme movement and getting some translation stuff, if you imagine you've got bones being, you know, you're leaning back for a deep badminton shot and you're arching the back suddenly and you're driving this forward, then the disc will be overused and it will buckle and that's when it can fracture and then you get the disc material bulging back and that so-called slip disc. Uh, again, I don't like the phrase myself. It's like a, I, I much prefer this, you know, this protruding disc or bulging because yeah. that's more of it. You know, like the side wall of your car tire bulging as the pressure comes. That's more or accurate. prolapsed. Yeah. I don't yeah. like the word exploding disc either. No, it's it's quite exciting. It's an exciting term, and I've, you know, and you, and you can see why because actually, you d I've seen MRIs where you've got discal material floating free. Yeah. That's back to the patients and your percep their perception of an injury that's why I don't like crumbling spine and all of this because once again it gives this idea that something's damaged irreversibly in a dreadful way in the body and you must never do what you love anymore you must just walk and uh, you must uh, rest and take it easy so that was where I was getting at with the, mm -hmm. with the sport so, so back to the people in their 50s to sort of wrap it up what would you would you say it, a it depends on how fit they were in the beginning yeah and B, it depends on what they were doing and if, was their exercise regime balanced and could it be they had an injury because they were just doing yeah. weights or just doing stretching and not mixing everything up. There is that aspect because you tend to do the things you like to the exclusion of other things and it's understanding that there has to be balance. So the things I would sort of take away is that you can always, you can do more than you think you can yeah. uh, and you should do more than you are doing. Because otherwise, if you were doing exactly the right amount of the right things, you wouldn't have a problem in the first place. That's what people fail to realise sometimes, is that if this problem, if you are in pain, it means that you're doing something wrong. Inadvertently, but you're not living the right lifestyle to keep your back healthy because it broke down. They did, your body will not intentionally punish you. So if yeah. something's gone wrong, you're doing something wrong somewhere. We all are. So if you even just understand that basic logic thing of saying, move more do something every day. It is perfectly okay to exercise five days a week. You wouldn't exercise at 100% five days a week, but you might do some walking on day one, some flexibility on day two, maybe a run or some gym work on day three, back to some yoga on day four. You know, you can do things, or you can just do three times a week, but you can't just do once a week and think it's gonna help. Just for And also about being in your comfort zone, the nervous system loves novelty. And it's always good to challenge it with different loads and different activities and different sports and different positions, like including a bit of jumping up and down or upside down movements or different speeds of Very movement. much so. Yes. Yeah. Getting asymmetrical, doing things that perturb you, that, that your body has to adapt to. Because there is that concept as well that you can use your body and movement to prevent aging in the brain as well. I mean, we've not really covered oh, yeah. this, but neuroplasticity. Oh, this massively. Like... I mean, because the frontal cortex, um, or the motor cortex, is part of the frontal lobe, which does all your voluntary movements, plus mm. that's where your personality lives. Yeah. And also, it's all back to the benefits of exercise and the vascular system and uh, and such like. Yeah, I know we could have so many different people chats who, about this. People, elderly it, people who exercise have younger brains. Yeah, it makes something called BDNF as well when you exercise, and endorphins and everything, but... You know, I always say to people, we're a machine that's designed to move. Yeah, that's exact. I say exactly yeah. the same thing. I say, you might not like it, but you are not designed to sit at a desk. If you sit at a desk, your body's going to think you've changed roles and it will make you better. And, and, and I, I describe this as well. I sort of say, you know, if you go to the gym, if you want to get fit, you know that the more time you go to the gym, or if you want to run a marathon, the more time you run, the better at it you'll get. But we never think conversely that the more time we sit at a desk, the better at it we'll get. So you get shortened muscles, you get weak muscles, you get f fat deposition because your body changes its hormones, it's, you know, it changes its energy levels, you, know, you lower your metabolic rate. It, we've, we don't think that our body will do the detriment because it thinks, well, it wouldn't harm us, but it's not doing the detriment, it's doing what you're asking it to do. And I always just say, be careful what you ask your body to do. If you exercise, it'll get better at that. If you sit, it'll get better at that. It's only doing what you're asking it to do. You just have to be careful. <laughs> Thank you very much for watching. Simon and I are going to be talking again about all kinds of other topics coming soon. But in the meantime, if you want to chat to Simon, then if you could call this number below.